So I got I started getting harassed around the time of the royal wedding. The moment that people knew I disagreed with some things about my sisters. Um, I grew up as an only child and I wished I had siblings. It's like everything. It's lie upon lie upon lie. Hello to all my gorgeous, good looking friends. You are tuning into TRG's series covering the Markle versus Markle defamation lawsuit. If you are new to the channel, welcome. For those who are returning, thank you for coming back and supporting my work. I'm always grateful to have this like-minded community to discuss the beloved royal family and the cultural impact of its members on society, particularly in America. Okay, before I get into this, let me just put the disclaimer. I am not a legal expert. I am simply just reading what's in the public core files and giving my interpretation and observations slash opinions. Please do your own research and come to your own conclusion. Failure to prepare is preparation for failure. November 8th is approaching quickly for the Markle versus Markle defamation lawsuit. This upcoming in-person oral hearing will be a make or break to see whether or not this case moves forward and goes to trial or it just becomes dead in the water. In today's video, we're gonna take a look at the first oral argument to get an idea as to how Megan's lawyers are going to present itself in this next oral argument to get this case dismissed. There are some bullet points that I would like to make throughout this because I think there's some gotchas that I believe Samantha's team could take advantage and use in order to move this case forward. Now, I do believe that the only information that will be considered at this time is what has been submitted in the third amended complaint, as well as the information that was submitted in Megan's motion to dismiss, as well as the supporting documents that have been filed so far. There will be no opportunity to submit new information, even though there's a lot of other evidence that can come forward. At this time, it's really just arguing what is being stated in the reasons for or against moving this case forward. Now, if you've been following this case with me, you will remember that the first go around with this oral argument, finding freedom and the evidence supporting Megan giving information to Jason Knopf and then Knopf to Scobie had been thrown out of court because of the statute of limitations. It's a reason why we're not talking about finding freedom anymore, because uh, on itself with the book, there's no evidence of Megan being the one who is responsible for the information and the publishing of the book. So putting that aside, we're now given the opportunity to keep the Oprah interview, as well as bring in the claims that were made in the Netflix documentary. And this is kind of where we're at right now. So I've taken the time to review what was said back in February in the first oral argument about the Oprah interview. And what I found, I think, in my opinion, are two additional details that I believe should solidify and help Samantha's case. Let's go over the first one. So in the transcript, Michael Kump, Megan's lawyer, begins to say, but in the interview, according to the transcript, Oprah asked, what is your relationship with her? Unquote. And again, referring to Megan's half-sister, and Megan responded, quote, I don't feel comfortable talking about people that I really don't know, but I grew up as an only child, Un in quotes. And then Oprah asked, so you all weren't close? And Megan responded, no. Now, on the surface, if you're reading that, it's very to the point. And you would say, okay, what's the issue here? This is what Megan said. Right, I, I don't feel comfortable talking about people that I really don't know, but um, I grew up as an only child, which everyone who grew up around me knows. And I wished I had siblings. I would have loved to have had siblings. That's why I'm so excited to be pregnant, so that Archie has someone. What this lawyer does, and I think it's very sneaky and is very selective on how he presents quotes. And what I mean by that, cherry picking, which words to leave out and which parts to emphasize and not focus on almost as a deflection. We could chalk it up to making an honest mistake, but I'm noticing this more and more as I've been reading through the dockets. It's like little things, but those little things could make or break the case, in my opinion. 
So that was not what was exactly said. And he continues to say, now read in context. It is obvious that Megan's statement, quote, I don't feel comfortable talking about people that I really don't know, but I grew up as an only child, which she offered in response to the question, you know, what is your relationship with your half-sister on your father's side, unquote, was not a statement of objective fact involving genetics or DNA or biology. Rather, it was a statement of expression of her own personal and subjective feelings and beliefs about how she experienced growing up and how she feels today about her childhood. There are no objective standards to measure those types of personal statements or feelings. There's no way to determine if it's true or false. I have to disagree with this stupid logic, but let me show you what was then said now in the updated amended complaint in their reasoning for getting this point dismissed. So in Megan's motion to dismiss, they write statement number two is, I grew up as an only child and I wish I had siblings, recognizing that the court already held that plaintiff cannot plausibly disprove defendant's opinion of her own childhood. Plaintiff argues that in context of the other statements about Samantha, this statement was a denial that Samantha played a part in her life and her upbringing. It was no such thing, but regardless, this inference is not defamatory because whether Samantha played a part in her life and her upbringing which she did not, is equally unfalsifiable. Now, here is why Megan's lawyer's argument falls completely flat. His argument that the way Megan sees her childhood is purely opinion, and I would have to agree with that, but in her statement itself contradicts this theory of how she perceived Samantha not being a part of her life. It doesn't negate the fact that she acknowledges that she has a sibling, but at the same time then lies about not having a sibling. In Samantha's third amended complaint, she argues back on this by saying, Megan stated, I grew up as an only child, which, as everyone who grew up around me knows, and I wish I had siblings. Although taken as an isolated statement, one could misinterpret the only child statement as a statement of how Megan felt. However, when put in context of the other statements about Samantha, this statement was a denial that Samantha played a part in her life and her upbringing. So in my opinion, in order for Samantha's team to get out of getting caught in Megan's feelings, then they need to emphasize more on the second part of what she says, which is this, and I wish I had siblings, because then this now paints Megan as the asshole that she is, because she had Samantha. What, she wasn't good enough? And I think that should be proposed forward because that now paints the narrative of Megan not seeing Samantha as a human being, as someone who is invisible, that doesn't exist. And that tells me that Megan has no regard for human life. The fact that she could block her sister as if she doesn't even exist and then continue to carry out these various tactics to attack her sister from multiple angles just shows she is malicious at heart. With all the Harkle drama, we've seen how vindictive this couple is. And no doubt in my mind, if she can blank her sister in this manner and be behind a targeted hate campaign against her, there's no doubt the same type of campaign had been against her father. And in my mind, I think she would have been okay if she accelerated the death of her father. Look, folks, this is a woman who had no problem accelerating the death of Prince Philip and the death of the Queen by adding all her drama and lies for the family when the, they were at their lowest moments. So in this situation, yeah, I believe Meghan wouldn't give a shit if anything happened to Samantha. And when you realize the extent that Meghan went to in order to damage Samantha's reputation, to put her physical safety in harm, and to allow the global media to attack her, you gotta say that she's a cruel woman. So going back to what Megan said and focusing on the latter part of the statement, and I wish I had siblings, completely proves Samantha's argument in saying that this statement was a denial that Samantha played a part in her life. Whether or not Megan wants to feel like they were close or not is irrelevant. Samantha was a part of her life in the role of being a sibling. And after Megan says, oh, and I wish I had siblings, that's why I'm so excited that Archie is now going to have someone. 
No, Megan, you had siblings, but you were just too embarrassed of the cards that you were dealt with. If you really wanted a sister and sibling, you had one right there. Just because you hate yourself, Megan, doesn't mean you get to take it out on your disabled sister. Megan can backpedal all she wants on this one, but there is fact there. She had siblings. That's the fact. So to negate that, even though she's not necessarily denying that she has siblings, she technically is denying it with the latter part of that statement. And that's where this argument blows up for her lawyer. Megan may think she grew up like an only child. I could understand that. And possibly if she truly meant that she was not trying to do what Samantha is saying that she has been really doing, then she would have said that. But this was clear and this was deliberate to distance herself away from Samantha and pretty much paint Samantha as a liar. Now, the second detail that I think could make an impact if it is parlayed in the right way is this one. Now, going back to the oral argument, Megan's lawyer, Michael Kump, goes in to say, the last statement that plaintiff identifies is statement number 10, and plaintiff alleges in paragraph 33 that Megan stated that plaintiff, quote, only changed her surname to Markle after the Duchess started dating Prince Harry so that Mrs. Markle could cash on her newfound fame, unquote. But the lie that is alleged in the complaint so she could cash in on her newfound fame is a fabrication. That was never said in the interview at all. Now, according to the transcript, again, taking the words, all Megan said was that, quote, she changed her last name back to Markle, and I think she's an early 50s at the time, only when I started dating Harry, unquote. That's how the transcript reads. No, she changed her last name back to Markle in, I think she's an early 50s at that time, only when I started dating Harry. Now, fast forward in the third amended complaint, the argument by Megan's team begins as such. Finally, statement number four is Samantha changed her surname back to Markle when Meghan started dating Prince Harry. Once again, this is the same statement that the court has already warned plaintiff was substantially true. Although this claim will be dismissed without prejudice, cocky, right? The court has reviewed defendant's argument and taken judicial notice of the court dockets relating to the truth of this statement. Ironically, the new allegations intended to bolster statement number four actually doom it. In particular, plaintiff now admits that she has used her family name, Markle, interchangeably all of life. Once again, Megan's lawyers are selective in choosing the words that they're using and just so happens to leave out the most important word in the particular quote, which was only. Well, Samantha's lawyers caught that sneaky manipulation and they fired back with a sir reply on their motion to dismiss. Right on the front page, they write, comments stated in Oprah are actionable. Megan knew that Samantha used the name Markle as well as Rasmussen, the surname of her former husband and children, depending on the circumstances all along. By fabricating that Samantha changed her name only when I started dating Harry. She implied that Samantha, who she falsely said she did not know, had gone so far as to change her name for the purpose of unconsciously capitalizing on her supposedly non-relationship with Megan. That word only is a powerful little word, and it's not shocking as to Michael Comp purposely leaving that out, in my opinion. That one little word represents one reason. And that reason for Samantha changing her last name was because Megan began dating Prince Harry. But folks, this wasn't a radio show where people were listening to this interview. They were watching it with their eyes. And when Megan stated that Samantha Markle changed her name back to Markle only when she was dating Prince Harry, there was an emphasis with her finger indicating one meaning one, this was the reason. Only when I started dating Harry. And you cannot refute that the purpose and the intention with stating this, and as you can visually see, the purpose of emphasizing using her finger was to clearly show the world, emphasizing with her finger the one reason why Samantha changed her last name back to Markle 
was because of her now dating Harry. As if to say, well, because now I have elevated myself into this new stratosphere, Samantha now wants to ride on my coattails by using the last name Markle, which is ridiculous because Samantha had been using Markle and the other last names interchangeably. So, you know, for her to emphasize that, it just shows that was the reason for why Samantha now is going by Samantha Markle. By using the word only and that finger point to emphasize that specific point paints Samantha as an opportunist, especially after Megan had laid out the fact that she didn't know Samantha. Only when I started dating Harry. Only when I started dating Harry. Hmm. So I think that says enough. Let's all not forget that at the time this interview was going on, Samantha was publishing her book. And although it didn't really have anything to do with Megan, it was believed or rumored to be a tell-all, which it wasn't. Even before this interview, there was an active campaign going on social media with the Sussex Squad in trying to discredit Samantha. And this just sort of sealed the narrative that Megan was trying to push, which was Samantha was deceptive and an opportunist who would go so far as to change her last name only because Megan was dating Harry in order to capitalize and profit. And about at this time in 2021, the harassment and the stalking and her physical safety being put in jeopardy was seriously at an all-time high. So this just added to the hate that Samantha had been getting ongoing since 2018. Considering that Samantha is in a wheelchair and disabled, Megan knew what she was doing here, which was gaslighting and adding fuel to the already fire that Samantha had been enduring. At no point did Megan make any attempt to try and smooth this drama going on with her family. In fact, I believe that this sadistic bitch enjoyed seeing Samantha get bullied, get threatened, harassed, and this Oprah interview really just served as a gaslighting exercise to make things even worse for her. It's reasonable to think that what Megan was doing, not only just that day on Oprah, but throughout the last several years in not denouncing the squad, seeing what's going on in social media and allow it to continue without saying anything. What's worse is that this woman who professes herself as a female advocate did this to her disabled sister in hopes to hurt her, not only financially, but also putting her safety in jeopardy, which, you know, I think is sick. Even more sick, after this Oprah interview, Megan continued on with this Netflix mockumentary in which she proceeded to continue to defame her sister. Now, we all saw this in 2022, but realized that everything was filmed in 2021. So after Megan went on this shit show interview, it continued with the filming of her series. I really do hope that the judge does see that there's a lot more to this case than what's on the surface. So far, Megan's lawyers have been using the argument that everything that Megan has said is pure opinion and feelings, as Megan is entitled to freedom of speech, right? I know, it's laughable. But this is why this must move forward to trial, because how else is it going to be exposed that these two have been undermining the Constitution and trying to take away Americans' First Amendment rights? I do believe that Samantha Markle's First Amendment rights have been violated as a result of Meghan and Harry's targeted hate-coordinated campaign against her. It needs to be exposed that Harry was acting as an unregistered foreign agent on the Aspen Commission of Information Disorder in producing that report that has now been affecting and influencing policy here in the United States. These two had access and were working with the very same people who are now being sued for violating Americans' First Amendment rights. Is it a coincidence that during this time, many people who criticized Meghan Markle were equally deplatformed and silenced? We shall see. I hope the judge moves this forward so this can all come out. What do you guys think? Do you think some of these are valid arguments that I'm raising here? I know that they're small details, but hopefully it could make an impact. So let me know your thoughts. Definitely leave your comments below. And as always, I will be back with more content. But until then, please be safe and I'll talk to you later. Bye. Oh, yeah. Such a broad. <laughs> <laughs>